and uh, I think it's, uh, it's 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 important that I that I say this. Uh, my work would be completely meaningless without my readers, uh, and this is uh, my my opportunity to to give back and to thank you all for reading me and for listening to me and for supporting my work and for the solidarity. I, I just hugely appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, I am absolutely wiped out. I've had, I, I'm running on fumes. I've had like four hours sleep in the last three days. Um, and I'm 69 next birthday. <laughs> The spirit is still willing. Um, this talk is going to run a bit longer than an hour. It might even run closer to 90 minutes. I hope you'll bear with me. Um, what I propose to do afterwards, um, because I find this works best, is that uh, I'll be sitting at a table, probably this one, uh, and I'm there to do the following. Uh, first of all, to take brief individual questions. It would be good if we could keep them fairly brief because of the other people behind. Secondly, uh, to sign books and dedicate books personally. Um, and thirdly, I'm totally up for taking photographs if anybody, anybody wants to do that. Don't be shy. If you want to do a picture with this old guy, you know, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy. Totally, totally happy to do that. So we shall, we shall begin. Uh, this, of course, is, uh, is a book that's entirely focused on the Americas. So you will not be surprised if I begin with ancient Egypt. <laughs> uh, and what we're looking at here, but there's a reason for that, and we'll come to it. What we're looking at here are the, unfortunately we can hardly see them because of the sunlight shining through the screen, but what we're looking at are the ancient Egyptian pyramid texts, which are the oldest religious writings of ancient Egypt. And they're a kind of guidebook for the soul on the journey through the afterlife realm that the ancient Egyptians, we believe, we must all make after death, a very challenging and demanding journey on which we would be held to account for the lives that we have lived. Uh, these texts are available in, in translation. The Faulkner edition of the ancient Egyptian pyramid texts is an excellent translation. I would urge you to take, take a look at these texts. They're four and a half thousand years old and they're full of wisdom and magic and mystery. Um, they seek to prepare us for our journey through the afterlife realm that the ancient Egyptians called the Duat, D-U-A-T. And it was an afterlife kingdom, and it was ruled over by the god Osiris, who the ancient Egyptians saw as the form of the constellation of Orion. When the ancient Egyptians looked up at the night sky and they saw the constellation of Orion, they were seeing the figure of their god of resurrection and rebirth, the god Osiris. Uh, the afterlife kingdom has a very prominent feature running through it, and that is the Milky Way. We can, we can say for sure that the ancient Egyptian afterlife kingdom was a region of the sky between Orion and Leo, with the Milky Way running through it. Uh, and oddly enough, the same pattern appears on the ground at Giza. Now, I'm not saying that whoever made the majestic structures of the Giza Plateau actually put the Nile River there. No, they didn't do that. But uh, what I'm saying is that this was one of the reasons why this site was chosen. Because there's an ancient principle, as above, so below, the marriage of heaven and earth, which is manifested in these ideas. Um, and and uh, the ancient Egyptians called the Milky Way the winding waterway. Uh, and they believe that our souls must ascend to the constellation of Orion, pass through a portal in the constellation of Orion, and then make a journey along the, the Milky Way, where they would be confronted by challenges uh, and ordeals. The three great pyramids, my colleague Robert Baval was the first to dis discover this, the three great pyramids match the pattern of the three stars of Orion's belt. The Nile matches the Milky Way, constellation of Leo matches the Sphinx. The only problem is that this sky, because the stars in the skies change their positions down the ages, this sky is not the sky of 4,500 years ago where the Great Pyramids are supposed to have been built. This is the sky of a very specific epoch between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And that's an epoch 
uh, an epoch of tumult and chaos in the world, and geologists call it the Younger Dryas. We will have a much more to say about it. How did the soul rise up from this? Giza is a three-dimensional model of the afterlife kingdom. How did the soul rise up from the ground to the sky? This is made very clear in the Great Pyramid, which has a narrow shaft cut through its southern side, which targets, points directly at the lowest of the three stars of Orion's belt. And it's understood that this was a soul shaft or a star shaft through which the soul of the deceased would ascend to that portal in Orion and then transit through it to the Milky Way and begin the journey through the afterlife kingdom. Now we're in Moundville in Alabama. Uh, and the last thing I expected to find in Moundville in Alabama was the ancient Egyptian religious system more or less complete and intact. It came as a complete surprise to me. Uh, and the surprise just grew as I wandered around Moundville and started to read the notice boards there, as everybody does when we, when we visit a new, a new site. Uh, and there I learned that uh, the Mississippi Valley civilization also venerated the constellation of Orion. Uh, but they figured the constellation of Orion not as a man, but as a, as a hand, uh, a, a, a wrist and a hand with the fingers pointing downwards, and what is often wrongly interpreted as an eye in the palm of the hand. Uh, that, in fact, is not an eye. That is a portal. Um, so here, from the, from the Marville Museum, the gateway or portal between the celestial realms and the Earth disk was symbolized and artistically rendered as an open hand with an eye in its palm. We know the hand as part of the constellation of Orion. Once the portal was crossed, the souls of the dead began their journey by walking along a road or ribbon of light, the Milky Way, which was called the Path of Souls. And over time, the Moundville Chieftain became a place of, of, of burial for, for the deceased from all over the Mississippi Valley. And people brought their dead there because they believed that Moundville was the appropriate place for the spirit to start its journey along the Path of Souls. And thus, over time, Moundville became, in the minds of its people, not only the symbolic gateway to the realm of the dead, but also the materialized image of that sacred domain on Earth. That's exactly what the Giza pyramids and the whole Giza complex are. They're a materialized image of the ancient Egyptian afterlife realm. This is how it works. The stars of Orion's belt represent the wrist of the Native American hand constellation, and other stars represent the thumb and the fingers. And that portal in the palm of the hand that is the Orion Nebula, which lies directly beneath the belt stars uh, of the constellation of Orion. Uh, quite a number of really excellent scholars have been working on cracking the code of the Mississippi Valley Civilization, and their, their results have been really amazing. They've done absolutely incredible work, and I want to pay tribute to Professor George Langford one of these experts, and I'm quoting from him here when he explains how it is that the soul gets up to Orion to transit to the Milky Way to begin that journey. And it says the portal in the hand must be entered by a leap at the optimum time, a leap up to the sky, just like that leap up to the sky that is indicated in the ancient Egyptian system. George Langford also draws attention uh, to a fearsome image of a certain a woman whose name is the Brain Smasher, uh, or the Brain Taker. And her task is to destroy memory and humanity by removing or smashing the brain. Um, and her role is the annihilation and permanent destruction of unworthy souls of the damned uh, on the afterlife journey. So I was really intrigued by this vignette from the ancient Egyptian book of what is in the Duat. It's one of those ancient Egyptian funerary texts related to the pyramid texts. And this, is, this was translated by Sir E. A. Wallace Budge. But unfortunately, Budge did not translate these hieroglyphs. As I first looked at the scene, this is what I, what I see. I see the figure of a goddess. And she is standing with her hands outstretched towards a man who is kneeling before her. And that man is literally smashing out his own brains with a hatchet. Um, and I intuitively felt that the goddess was not trying to stop him 
smashing out his brains. Rather, it seemed that this was a will that was being exerted to make him do that to himself. But I needed to know, and I don't translate ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, so I went to the British Museum, and I had a hieroglyphics expert there, Louise Ellis Barrett, do the translation for me. She asked me, why do you want me to translate this? I said, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, we, just, we just did the deal, and I said, you know, you just translate it for me, you tell me what this says. Um, and I didn't want to put any ideas into her mind uh, beforehand. And this was the translation she came up with as regards the role of that goddess. She lives from the blood of the damned, and from what these gods provide her. That bar soul who belongs to the damned, the demolishing one who cuts the damned to pieces. In other words, she is exactly the brain smasher or the brain taker that we find in the Mississippi Valley. There are monstrous uh, winged serpents in the ancient Egyptian netherworld. It's full of these curious, fearsome entities. And there are monstrous winged serpents in the ancient Mississippi Valley netherworld as well. One of the challenges on the path of souls in the Native American tradition was a a creature called the underwater panther. Uh, and there's an image of the underwater panther here. Uh, my wife Santa took this photograph in the Manville Museum. It's on a very small scale. It's a clay figure, clearly a feline. I'm struck by the similarity to the Great Sphinx of Giza. Of course, the Great Sphinx is on a much larger scale. I and my colleagues have long argued that the Great Sphinx is much more ancient than the time of the pharaohs that the Great Sphinx is more than 12,000 years old, and that it originally took the form entirely of a lion, with a lion head and a lion body. But that as the thousands of years passed and heavy rains poured down on the Sphinx and the head became heavily eroded, the head was damaged. And in Pharaonic times, in the fourth dynasty, the head was recarved uh, into this human form. But I'm really struck by the the way that the tail of the underwater panther curls down and the same thing with the tail of the sphinx and the, the positioning of the paws. Um, amongst uh, the ancient Egyptians, the god Horus uh, played a key role. Uh, and the, what he represented was the triumph of life over death. Uh, and he was figured uh, as, a, as a, a human figure uh, with the body of a man and the head of a horse. Uh, we have an identical figure in the Mississippi Valley, and here's a depiction of him carved onto a whelk shell. Uh, and he's called the Birdman. Uh, he also represents the triumph of life after death, and he is also a human figure with the head of a hawk. At a certain point, and we'll go into this further, you begin to wonder whether all this can be explained by pure coincidence, or whether there's some underlying connection. And I want to be clear now that I am not arguing that the ancient Egyptians made a sort of missionary expedition to the Mississippi Valley, or that the people of the Mississippi Valley made a missionary expedition to ancient Egypt. I am suggesting that both ancient Egypt and the Mississippi Valley received a legacy, the same legacy. They were the separated children who received a legacy from a remote common ancestor, and that legacy is what we see manifested in these symbolism and these religious beliefs. Let's hop over to the Amazon jungle. Uh, the Amazon rainforest, uh, where there exists uh, a powerful uh, hallucinogenic, I don't like that word, I would prefer to say a powerful visionary brew <coughs> called ayahuasca, which will plunge us into an extremely deeply altered state of consciousness. And what ayahuasca means is the vine of the dead, or the vine of souls. Um, and in ayahuasca visions, and I can speak from experience because I've had more than 70 sessions with ayahuasca myself. I, I initially went to the Amazon to drink it as part of a research project, but I found it so intriguing and the teachings I received so valuable that I have continued to work with it, although I have to say that I have to brace myself uh, every time I go into the experience. It's not a physically pleasant experience and it can be it can be quite scary. So in ayahuasca visions, we, we, we meet intelligent entities. They often have the heads of animals and the bodies of human beings. But what we all see, this is universal. There have been detailed scientific studies published on this. What we all see is geometry. There's loads and loads of geometry in ayahuasca visions, particularly in the early stages of the visions. And the Shipibo of the Peruvian Amazon 
uh, paint or depict their ayahuasca visions in their art. And they focus on these geometric patterns which are inspired by the imagery that they have seen uh, in the ayahuasca state. The Tucano uh, are a tribe of the Amazon whose whole lives revolve around ayahuasca, the Australo-Melanesian signal. That everything that's put forward about it is purely speculative. Um, but one of the suggestions that he made to me, which he regarded as interesting, is this possibility, that someone holding this signal comes into the Americas, not through Beringia, but crossing into South America across the ocean. Based purely on the genetic data, this is the most parsimonious explanation. And, and when a scientist says that an explanation is parsimonious, uh, he or she are saying that they like that explanation. It's a simple, direct, obvious, clear explanation, and very often the most obvious explanation is the right explanation. However, there's a problem with this explanation, as SK admitted to me, because archaeologists insist that our ancestors were incapable of crossing the world's oceans during the last ice age. By all means, in more recent times they could. Look at the Polynesian expansion, which is about 3,000 to 3,500 years ago. They got themselves all the way to Easter Island, this tiny little dot, which is 2,000 miles from the coast of South America and 2,000 miles from Tahiti, the Polynesians were amazing navigators. But that's three or three and a half thousand years ago. That's not 13,000 years ago. That's not the end of the Ice Age. So for archaeologists to accept that anybody could have crossed the Pacific Ocean during the Ice Age is deeply unpalatable. And they strongly and powerfully resist that notion because it goes against all their ideas of the human story. Let's go back to the Amazon. It, it does seem like an unlikely setting for science. But actually, there's quite a lot of evidence of an ancient practice of science uh, in the Amazon rainforest. Uh, there are more than 150,000 different species of plants and trees in the Amazon. You need two of them to make ayahuasca. <laughs> Neither one of those two is psychoactive on its <laughs> own. They only work when you put them together. Consider the project of identifying those two plants <laughs> out of 150,000 different species of plants and trees. Here is one of them. It's known as Chacruna in the Amazon. The botanical name is Cicotria viridis. Its leaves contain dimethyltryptamine, DMT, which is arguably the most powerful hallucinogen uh, known to man. And when Westerners experience DMT, they generally experience it by smoking it or vaping it. And when they do that, and I again speak from experience, I've had about 18 or 19 DMT trips, it's like a rocket ship to the other side of reality. And I said, when you hit the dose, there's nothing you can do about it. The matter is taken completely out of your hands. I can't even sit. I have to lie down. And, and I am just whisked off into this incredible, beautiful, seamlessly convincing, baffling, confusing, parallel realm, uh, and it pours in upon you, and it's so powerful that it's very hard to remember any of it. You come back feeling that something amazing has happened, but you're not quite sure what it was. How do you, how do you integrate it? See, the thing about DMT is it isn't available normally orally. It's not available through the gut, and that's because we have an enzyme in the gut called monoamine oxidase, which switches off DMT on contact. In the Amazon, they learned how to make it available to the guts. Because the second element of the ayahuasca brew is the ayahuasca vine. And just like those leaves, it's not psychoactive orally itself. But when you, what it contains is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. So the ayahuasca vine shuts down that enzyme in the gut and allows the DMT to be absorbed orally. And then it produces not a 10 minute rocket ship to the other side of reality, but a four or five hour slow boat to the other side of reality, where you have a lot of time to integrate your experiences and figure out what's going on and remember and sense the, the impact of what is happening. Uh, new world monkeys uh, have a distinctive feature which old world monkeys don't have. New world monkeys have prehensile tails. Um, the thing about a prehensile tail is that if you're hunting a monkey, 
uh, and many of the Amazonian hunter-gatherers depend rather heavily on monkeys for their protein uh, in their diet. If you're hunting a monkey uh, and you shoot it with an arrow that is not tipped with curare, uh, if, you, if you do that, as the monkey falls from the tree, that prehensile tail will whip up and coil around a branch, and the monkey will be left hanging from the branch. And suddenly, dinner is 200 feet above you. And the only way to get it is to shin up that tree, which you don't want to do. But curare is the answer. It was invented in the Amazon. We do not know when. It is made from 11 different plants, none of which are effective on their own. At certain stages in the process, the vapors themselves are lethal. What curare is, is a neuromuscular toxin. It causes the muscles to relax. And as a result of causing the muscles to completely relax, that prehensile tail cannot wrap around the branch, and the monkey drops straight to the ground, and dinner is served. Uh, our modern anesthesiology is based on curare. Uh, however, we use a synthetic form today. So this is an example of where Western technological societies have learned from the science of the Amazon. Francisco de Orellana was the first European to cross the entire length of South America, and he did so by following the entire length of the Amazon River, and it happened by accident. Uh, he was part of a group of 200 men who started off their journey in Quito in Ecuador, in the Andes, uh, and they were going to search for El Dorado. This was the great obsession of the Spanish conquistadors, to find El Dorado. But two or three days into the, into the Amazon, they kind of got stuck, uh, and there was no food, and there were a lot of complaints, and people were starving, but the Spanish were very resourceful, and they actually built a boat by the sides of the Amazon. And Orellana and 50 of the guys got into that boat, and their mission was to go hunting. Uh, for a few days, they said they'd be back in two days, and they would bring back food to the base camp. The Amazon disagreed. Uh, the powerful stream of the Amazon carried them rapidly downstream. They started in December 1541, they were carried the entire length of the Amazon River, and in August 1542, they ended up in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and then they made their way to Mexico, and thence back to South America. On that journey along the Amazon, Oriana reported seeing extraordinary things. He reported seeing huge populations. He reported seeing enormous, sophisticated <laughs> cities, highly advanced arts and crafts, every every sign of, of, of a sophisticated civilization. But a hundred years later, when other Europeans began to penetrate the Amazon, they couldn't find these cities or the huge populations. And they decided that Oriana had made the whole thing up, that he was a, a liar, a fantasist. But he wasn't. He had been telling the truth all along. The problem was that the Spaniards had brought smallpox into the Amazon, and that smallpox the, the Amazonian populations had no resistance to it. It spread like wildfire through the Amazon. It destroyed the indigenous populations. The cities were deserted. Within 50 years, they were overgrown by the jungle. A hundred years later, there was nothing to see. And uh, those cities are now emerging because of the clearances uh, of the Amazon, uh, huge numbers of them. Cities which had populations larger than the city of London at the same period of history. And it's estimated that at that time, before the arrival of the Spaniards, the Amazon had a population of more than 20 million people. That's a really astonishing thing, because rainforest soils are not particularly productive. It's why it's such a bad deal to cut down rainforest and make a soybean farm. Because, because the rainforest keeps its own fertility, but once you take the trees away, it rapidly becomes infertile. So how did they support these huge populations? The answer is that at least 8,000 years ago, because that's the oldest examples that have survived, and again, I make the point that since so much of the Amazon has not been studied, we are likely to find much older examples. At least 8,000 years ago, the inhabitants of the Amazon invented a soil, a man-made soil. It's called an anthropogenic soil. Uh, it's referred to as terra preta or Amazonian black earth, or the Amazonian dark earths. Um, it is formed around biochar, uh, but it also, and, and it results from the wet burning of middens, but it also includes millions of species of bacteria that are not found in neighboring soils. 
And you can take a handful of 8,000 year old terra preta, and you can add it to infertile barren soil and it will turn that whole soil rich and fertile uh, almost immediately. So it's an astonishing, miraculous thing <coughs> that's sitting there in the Amazon jungle waiting to be explained. Uh, another uh, result of the clearances of the Amazon is that we are becoming aware of huge geometrical structures within the Amazon. Uh, they're not made of stone, these geometrical structures. They're earthworks, very much like the earthworks of the Mississippi Valley. Uh, and they take uh, the form, for example, of uh, here we see a square uh, and a square surrounding a circle um, at a place called Jacosa. Uh, this is on a scale of hundreds of meters. Uh, here we see an octagon surrounding a square. Uh, here two circles side by side at Ramado Capitara, a square and a circle. Um, here at Tikinho, the largest of the two squares measures 210 meters along each side. Uh, and here at Fazenda Pirano and at Severino Calazans, we have combinations of two squares. And in each case, these squares are perfectly aligned to true north, true south, true east, and true west, which tells us that astronomers uh, were involved in setting these sites out. Uh, furthermore, the larger of the two squares at Severino Calazans has a base area that is identical to the base area of the Great Pyramid of Giza, 230 meters along each side. This complicated site is called Fazenda Colorado. We've got a couple of different photographic views of it here. And here's a map. Unfortunately, some modern road, a modern road has been cut through it. But this aspect of the design <coughs> strikes me as particularly interesting because if we rotate it, it resembles the Tucano idea of the entrance to the other world. After their ayahuasca visions, the Tucano will frequently paint the entrance to the other world. Uh, and it looks like this, very similar to this pattern. We know that these sites were not lived in. There's no evidence of any habitation there. They were used for some other function. Was it to do with that same quest for life after death that we find in the Mississippi Valley uh, and in ancient Egypt? Because certainly in ancient Egypt, the afterlife realm was filled with geometry, filled with squares and circles and pyramids, for example. There are also uh, stone monuments in the Amazon, uh, as well as the earthworks. Um, there are specifically megalithic circles uh, in the Amazon. This one is at a place called Rego Grande uh, in Brazil, and it's, beca it's become known locally in relatively recent years, it's a fairly recent discover discovery, as the Amazonian stone. <laughs> Uh, and it is recognized by archaeoastronomers as a solar aligned site. It may look like it's tumbling down or fallen down a bit, but it turns out that every single one of these stones is precisely and exactly placed in position, and indeed wedged into position with granite wedges to hold them, to hold them in place. And there's a reason for that, and it's to do with alignments to the position of the sun. Uh, I think we all know that there are key moments of the solar year. That the, the, the summer solstice is when the sun rises furthest north of east in the northern hemisphere. The winter solstice furthest south of east. Uh, and the equinox, the sun rises perfectly due east. So it makes this kind of pendulum swing along the horizon and it stops at furthest north. That solstice means sun stop and it stops at furthest south. Uh, and then it re resumes its pendulum journey. Well, it turns out that stone three at Rego Grande is angled so that with shadow effects, it tracks the entire path of the sun during the day of the winter solstice. Whereas stone one and two, with stone one having a hole drilled through it, if you look through that hole, you will be looking directly at the rising point of the sun on the winter solstice. So this whole site is celebrating the marriage of heaven and earth, as above, so below, on the solstice. The same is true at Stonehenge uh, in, in England. I go to Stonehenge regularly. It's only 20 miles from where I live in the southwest of England. It's an amazing site. Uh, and Stonehenge um, has a <coughs> principal axis. And that axis runs from what's called Sarsen Stone 16 to the heel stone. And here's the thing. If you go to Stonehenge at dawn on the winter solstice, uh, so, sorry, I am tired at dawn on the summer solstice. Uh, and if you stand behind Sarsen Stone 16 and look towards the heel stone, you'll see that the heel stone functions like the sight on a barrel of a rifle, and it targets exactly the rising point of the sun on the summer solstice. 
So Stonehenge is celebrating the marriage of heaven and earth on the summer solstice, just as Rego Grande is doing so on the winter solstice. And this theme, this idea is found all around the world. They're at the Temple of Karnak in Upper Egypt, majestic temple, one kilometer long narrow axis. The whole thing is about the winter solstice sunrise. You can go there at any other time of year, you will not see the sun rising directly down that axis. But you go there at dawn on the winter solstice and the sun is dead center on that axis and actually sits on top of a gateway specially constructed for that purpose. This is what you see if you get up uh, illegally on the back of the Great Sphinx. <laughs> you see the back of the Sphinx's head. Were you to be here at the summer solstice, the sun would be way over to the left here. If you're here at the winter solstice, the sun's way over to the right. But if you go there on the spring equinox, you discover what the Sphinx is all about. It is about the marriage of heaven and earth. Because the Sphinx's gaze targets directly the rising sun on the spring equinox. Sky and ground, as above, so below, making a connection uh, between the two. It's also the case of Angkor in Cambodia. Stand dead central on that central causeway, that narrow central causeway, look straight at the central tower, before dawn and watch the sun rise. And it will rise up the side of the central tower and then it will sit for a moment perfectly on top of the central tower and light the whole place up like a fairy tale kingdom. Let's now go to Serpent Mount in Ohio, uh, a truly majestic site, which I would, I would recommend anybody who has a chance to go to Ohio, go see Serpent Mount. And especially try to be there on the summer solstice. Try to be there on June 2021. Um, my wife Santa took this photograph with a drone uh, positioned 400 feet above Serpent Mount. Uh, and, and it gives you a sense of the scale of the thing. This, this serpentine mound actually is more than 1,300 feet in length. Um, and what it does is the head end of the mound, these open jaws with this oval formation in front of it, what they do is they target the setting sun on the summer solstice. Uh, and we were able to prove that for ourselves with the drone. Because you can have the drone up there, you can see the sun on the horizon, you can see the head of the serpent kind of seeking out the sun, and as the sun sinks lower, the alignment becomes clearer and clearer, and suddenly there you have it, this incredible, beautiful alignment of, uh, of, of heaven and earth. It's a, it's a mysterious, a sacred place, a wonderful, wonderful place to, to, to visit. And the ancients put this together. They connected ground and sky at Serpent Mound. Still in Ohio, let's uh, consider High Bank Works and Newark Earthworks, two of the great earthworks of the Mississippi Valley. I don't have time. Tonight, I'm only able to give you a fraction of what's in the book. I don't have time tonight to go in detail into High Bank, uh, but I do want to make one point about it. Here is a map of High Bank on the left. Here is a map of Newark on the right. Both of them have combinations of many different geometrical figures, but what they both have in common is a combination of an octagon and a circle, an octagon and a circle. These two sites are 60 miles <coughs> apart, yet the octagon-circle combination at High Bank is oriented at precisely 90 degrees to the octagon-circle combination at Newark. To do that across a distance of 60 miles, is very sophisticated geometry and survey. We tend to pass it by without noticing it, but something really extraordinary uh, was going on here. Uh, this is an aerial photograph of the octagon circle combination at Newark. Those parts that still survive are now largely contained within a private country club. <laughs> including an 18-hole golf course, <laughs> which promotes itself as, quote, unlike any other in the world. It is designed around famous prehistoric Native American earthworks that come into play on 11 of the holes. <laughs> Obviously, at some levels, it's annoying that this sacred, this amazing geometrical site is now part of a private golf club. But at another level, I welcome it. And the reason I welcome it is it means it's still there. More than 90% of the Native American earthworks that were documented in the 19th century are now completely gone. Mm. They have been plowed under for agriculture. They've been replaced by housing estates. 
They've been replaced by industrial parks. They've just been swept away. Only 10% are left. We're left with a tiny fraction of what was a giant project all over North America. Uh, but at least this private country club has preserved this fraction rather well. And you can get a sense of the scale of the earthworks uh, inside it from, from these images. There's an octagon circle combination in the Amazon as well, uh, by the way. Uh, back to Newark uh, and, and the other geometrical figures of Newark. This one is called the Great Circle. Um, and uh, I'm placing beside it uh, a map of Avebury in the southwest of England, again quite near where I live. Um, both of these circles, Avebury in England and the Great Circle at Newark, are true henges. We all know the word henge, and it's used in Stonehenge, but actually a henge is an earthwork. Uh, and the definition of a henge is that you have a deep earthwork ditch which is surrounded by a high embankment that goes outside the ditch. That's why immediate, immediately we know that these sites were not used for defense. If your ditch is a moat, you're going to place it outside your embankment, not inside your embankment. Uh, and actually, Avebury and the Great Circle at Newark are very much the same size. Avebury is 347 meters in diameter. Newark is 365 meters in diameter. Here's an aerial view of uh, Avebury, which used to have stone circles inside it as well. Very few of the megaliths are left. But you can see the great ditch running all the way around the central plaza, and then this huge embankment uh, on the outside of the ditch. That is a, a henge. It's a true henge. So also is this site in the Amazon a true henge, with the embankment outside the ditch at Ramal de Capitara. Uh, and here again, the embankment is outside the ditch. But this is a really interesting and complicated figure at Jagnosa. It's kind of doing what uh, has traditionally been attributed to the ancient Greeks, a, a geometrical exercise called squaring the circle. Uh, we are seeing here a square inscribing a circle. Uh, and oddly enough, uh, such a site also existed in Ohio. Uh, it was mapped by Squire and Davis in 1848 in Pike County. It no longer exists. It's one of those sites that's been swept away. Uh, and we find also recent archaeology, 2018, there was a square complex uh, inside the sun coast <coughs> of the two inner circles at Avery uh, as well. Back to Newark, interesting geometrical games being played. The great square at Newark, its perimeter is exactly equal to the circumference of the great circle. And the area of the great square is equal to the area of another figure called the observatory circle. So on an enormous scale, in gigantic earthworks, they're playing very clever mathematical and geometrical games, which you don't immediately notice. You have to do the measurement before it becomes clear. Uh, this concerns the moon. It's almost too complicated to go into here, but the moon, just like the sun, has its stopping points on the horizon. It has its extremes, furthest north of east, furthest south of east, and so on and so forth. And it moves between these maximum and minimum extremes over a period of 18.6 years. It's an 18.6 year cycle. Uh, and eight key points are indicated. Every one of those eight key points is targeted by the octagon circle combination at Newark. Every single one of them. And the ruling one, the most majestic, is north, maximum northern moonrise at Newark, where the moon rises in direct alignment with the central axis of the octagon circle combination. If we go to Cahokia in Illinois, the focus there is entirely on the sun. Cahokia is truly a city of the sun. It's not very old. Cahokia in the form we see it today is 1050 AD, about 1,000 years old, uh, not much older than that. We're looking at the um, largest pyramid in the Americas, north of Mexico, which is known as Monk's Mound. We don't know what the people of Cahokia called it. We call it Monk's Mound because a bunch of Trappist monks used it to grow vegetables uh, on its terraces in the 19th century. Um, here is a uh, plan of Cahokia. There's, there's Monk's Mound in the center. And over here to the west, you'll notice a structure called Woodhenge. It is the case that uh, in its prime, a great circle of wooden posts stood at uh, Cahokia. Uh, and, and indeed, archaeologists have excavated the post holes, and they found remnants of wood in the post holes and been able to date them. 
Exactly the same thing happens at Stonehenge in England. There's a Woodhenge at Stonehenge as well. And at, at um, Cahokia, the archaeologists have been able to reconstruct the original Woodhenge, hedge, and you can go and see it. It's there on the site now. And then we discover what it's all about. It's again all about these sky-ground connections. There's targeting of the summer solstice sunrise. There's targeting of the winter solstice sunrise. There is targeting through the center of the equinox sunrise. And this is the effect that you get on the spring equinox at dawn at Cahokia, this rising of the sun across the southern face of Monk's Mound. So I think it's kind of reasonable to say when we look at all of these monumental earthworks and their significant solar and lunar alignments that they are proof that a civilization and spiritual system built around sophisticated observations of the heavens did once flourish uh, in the Americas. But how far back can this system be traced? As I said, Cahokia is not very old. It's only a thousand years old. How, how far back can we go uh, to find the origins of this system? Well, we can go immediately to the lower Mississippi. The bottom of the Clovis Lair, which is up here, they did something unheard of because all their colleagues were saying, there's no point in digging deeper than Clovis because we know there was nothing there. He dug deeper. And lo and behold, thousand years ago. Al was again subjected to the savage attacks of his colleagues. What kind of science is it that instead of taking new information and considering what it might mean and trying to work with it, they just utterly dismiss it because it doesn't fit with a preconception that has been established by powerful individuals. Um, so not only that, this is Nature magazine, 26th of April 2017. This is an article by Tom Demeray and a number of colleagues. Tom is the chief paleontologist at the San Diego Natural History Museum. And uh, back in the early 1990s, there was road work going on uh, just south of San Diego. Uh, and there was an archaeologist attached to that road crew. And the grader went through, and suddenly it exposed the remains of a mastodon, and, and specifically of a mastodon tusk. So the, uh, the, the archaeologists stopped the work, and they excavated the site. But what they found was so mind-blowing and so dangerous to their careers in 1992 that they decided not to publish it. They wanted to be absolutely sure before they went into print. They wanted much better dating techniques. And as the years went by, those better dating techniques materialized. And finally, they were able to do the work thoroughly, completely confirm their findings and publish it in Nature. And it's no easy thing to get an article published in Nature. You have to go through a fearsome peer review process. But they succeeded in doing so. And what it documents is the presence of human beings in North America 130,000 years ago. That's more than 115,000 years before Clovis. It's twice as long as human beings were in Europe. It's twice as long as human beings were in the Americas. So I spent some time with Tom Demeray looking at his uh, evidence, which is now all in the San Diego Natural History Museum. Uh, and he told me the vicious attacks that he and his team have suffered, primarily from archaeologists, who can't bear the idea that humans were in the Americas 130,000 years ago. That just blows everything out of the water. Their entire life's work is utterly destroyed. Much better for them to destroy the new finding rather than to take it on board and see, and see where it goes. And Tom is still under attack uh, for these findings uh, to, the, to this day, but he sticks by his guns and I'm convinced he's right. The evidence is utterly compelling. I set it out in great detail uh, in the book. So, uh, if the Americas have been inhabited by humans for 130,000 years, oh, and let me be clear, Tom Demeray's site, the Ceruti Mastodon site, does not bear witness to an advanced civilization 130,000 years ago. I am not claiming that. What it bears witness to is that human beings were in America 130,000 years ago. Human beings were in America 130,000 years ago, but for more than 115,000 of those years, archaeologists haven't wanted to look at what they might have been doing. They haven't entered those much older deposits. So this is more than twice as long as Europe, twice as long as previously uh, s s supposed that, that our whole understanding of prehistory must change. We have a vast, resource-rich landmass here. It could have been the location of hitherto 
unrecognized and advanced, uh, advances and developments in the story of civilization. But is dogma alone enough to account for the fact that archaeologists have missed this 115,000 years of human activity in the Americas? No, it isn't enough. There is more to the story than that. And this black line running along this draw, this is Murray Springs in Arizona. This black line, it's called the black mat, or the Younger Dryas boundary there. That's what gives the game away because down at the base of the black mat, the black mat is full of soot and evidence of massive wildfires burning. But down at the very base of it, there's a very strange combination of miner mineral and chemical signatures. And those include iridium, platinum, melt glass, that is rather like trinitite created in nuclear explosions, uh, carbon microspherules, Taken in abundance, these signatures can only be explained by one thing, and that is a cosmic impact, something like an asteroid or a comet that hits the Earth. The nanodiamonds are created by the shock and heat of the impact. Blackwater Draw, uh, sorry, Murray Springs, was another important Clovis site. Uh, and it was excavated in the 1960s by C. Vance Haynes, who in fact was one of the leading proponents of the Clovis first model. And what he's doing is he's excavating a mammoth here. And that mammoth, firmly dated to 12,800 years ago, has a Clovis point embedded in its shoulder blade. So it was certainly hunted by the Clovis people. But then something cataclysmic happened because very suddenly, exactly at that time, the black mat was laid down right over the top of this mammoth. They gave the mammoth the name Eloise, and indeed it wrapped her up like shrimp. And the nanodiamonds, the iridium, the platinum, the melt grass were physically in contact with the remains of the mammoth uh, Eloise. And this is the moment when the Clovis culture vanish entirely from the record. And Vance Haynes, even though he stuck to that ludicrous Clovis first model, was amongst the first to notice that this was very strange, that something radical must have happened. It couldn't be explained by something simple. Something very major must have happened to explain this. And that explanation is now being offered. And it is called the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. It's been advocated since 2007. There are now more than 60 eminent scientists <coughs> behind it, and their argument is that the North American ice cap primarily was hit by several large fragments of a fragmented giant comet. Now, let me say a word or two about comets and asteroids and comet impacts in general. Uh, we're all aware that the dinosaurs were made extinct by an asteroid or a comet impact. It's actually not clear which it was. But that it was a cosmic impact uh, is sure. The first evidence that this was what wiped the dinosaurs out 65 million years ago was another black mat, exactly like the Younger Dryas boundary layer. You can see it here, but it's dated to 65 million years ago. And it contains exactly the same impact proxies. Iridium, carbon microspherules, nanodiamonds, shock quartz, melt glass, etc. Um, and uh, Lewis and Walter Alvarez, the father-son team who first put this hypothesis forward, were satisfied with the impact proxies. You can't get those proxies in that abundance with anything other than a cosmic impact. So they said it's obvious that dinosaurs were made extinct by a cosmic impact. They thought their colleagues would welcome it, but their <laughs> colleagues did not welcome it. <laughs> they spent 10 years being vilified by their colleagues and accused of the usual making it up and fantasy and so on and so forth, but they kept up their dedicated work and lo and behold, eventually, they found the crater. And the crater is deeply buried beneath the Gulf of Mexico, and since it was identified, nobody disputes any longer. A massive cosmic impact made the dinosaurs extinct. These events are world-changing events. I'm showing you an image of a dinosaurs and a chicken here, uh, because 
literally that event turned dinosaurs into chickens. <laughs> because the birds are all that's left of the dinosauria clay. Everything else was swept away. At the same time, skulking in the primeval forest was this little mammal, kind of a kind of shrew. And the mammals were going absolutely nowhere in a world ruled by dinosaurs. We had no hope whatsoever. <laughs> but then the cosmos came along and kindly got rid of those monstrous beasts. And the mammal line began to evolve very rapidly. It began to spread into niches that had previously been closed to it, to adapt to those niches, to evolve. And that's why we can now safely say, meet your 65 million year old mother. <laughs> because we are the descendants of that shrew. Uh, and uh, we would not be here if it hadn't been for that cosmic impact. The whole story of life on Earth would be different. Maybe there would be really smart dinosaurs. I don't know. <laughs> uh, human beings would not be here. Um, NASA tells us that these world-changing events, these extinction-level events, are, are very rare. Uh, and that they occur only once every 100 million years. It's so nice of the universe <laughs> to be, you know, that Germanic in its timekeeping that we can actually set our clocks by it. Uh, and since the last impact was 65 million years ago, why, we don't need to worry. 35 million years in the future is a long time. There's other more pressing problems. Uh, a number of leading astronomers disagree. The late Sir Fred Hoyle, Chandra Wickram Singh, Victor Kluge, Bill Napier are amongst them. Here is a NASA fact sheet, and it is also trying to reassure us. Uh, this fact sheet is about meteor showers. Everybody has seen a meteor shower. They are given certain names. The Perseids, for example, the, the Leonids, the Orionids, the Taurids. Every one of these meteor showers is the remnant debris of a former comet, which has broken up into multiple fragments, spread out along its orbit. The orbit has, the, 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 the debris trail has begun to widen, and uh, as the Earth passes through the debris trail, the meteorites come pouring into our sky. And NASA says, don't worry, nothing to worry about, usually from dust particle to boulder size. It's a curious thing. But there is not a single culture in the ancient world where the appearance of a comet in the sky was regarded as good news. <laughs> it was always regarded as bad news. And it was certainly bad news for the planet Jupiter when Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 hit it in 1994, the whole project being filmed uh, by NASA. Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 wasn't even that big. It was about six, maybe seven kilometers in diameter. It broke up into 21 glowing fragments. These fragments bombarded the surface of the planet Jupiter, creating scars on Jupiter's surface that were larger than the Earth itself. The total explosive power of those impacts is estimated at 300 gigatons. If you were to take the entire nuclear arsenal of the Earth today and blow it all up at once, it would yield 6.4 gigatons. And this puts it into perspective. We are dealing with massive, devastating events. And this is the moment to say, thank you, Jupiter, for taking one for the team. Thank you for being the giant guardian of our planet. For sweeping up most of the comets that come through into the inner solar system and keeping us safe. But every now and then, a comet gets through. And sometimes, it's a very big comet indeed. And the evidence is that a very big comet entered the inner solar system 20,000 years ago. I don't expect you to read this, but this is a paper published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society by Professor Bill Napier, who Professor of Astrobiology at the University of Cardiff in the UK, and its title is Paleolithic Extinctions and the Torrid Complex. He is referring specifically <coughs> to the Torrid Meteor Stream, which our Earth is still in interaction with twice every year. We pass through the Torrid Meteor Stream twice a year. And what he's saying is the evidence, decades <coughs> old now, and not even controversial amongst the comet community, is that an exceptionally large, low-inclination, short-period comet 
has been orbiting in our neighborhood for about 20,000 years. In such a disintegrating environment, there is a reasonable probability of a catastrophic encounter with debris in the comet trail. And he and his colleagues calculate that the first of those encounters took place 12,800 years ago. That that comet entered an Earth-crossing orbit, that for the next few thousand years, no harm was done, but it began to break up into multiple fragments, as comets do. And those fragments spread out along the orbit, and the whole tube of debris began to widen. And 12,800 years ago, several large objects estimated to be a kilometer or so in diameter fell out of the Taurid meteor stream and bombarded the Earth, with the bombardments being primarily focused on what was then the North American ice cap and on Greenland, which is extremely close to the North American ice cap. And so this is a diagram of the Torrid meteor stream. Uh, there are a number of known large objects within it. The most famous is Comet Enki. Comet Enki has a diameter of five or six kilometers. It's a big fragment of the original giant comet. Uh, comet Olgiato, Comet Rudniki, 19 of the brightest near-Earth objects are in the Torrid meteor stream. The Earth takes 12 and a half days to pass through the Torrid meteor stream in June, and it takes 12 and a half days to pass through it in November. And I liken it a little bit to uh, strapping on a blindfold, crossing our fingers, and crossing an eight-lane interstate, <laughs> just hoping that we don't meet any traffic. Uh, or if we do, that it would be motorcycles rather than trucks. <laughs> 12,800 years ago, the moment that Bill Napier signals as those first impacts out of the torrid meteor stream coincides exactly with massive extinctions of megafauna all around the world. And those extinctions were global, but they were particularly heavily focused in the Americas, where 70% of the North American large mammal genera went extinct between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, precisely the period of the geological epoch known as the Younger Dryas. The most recent documented encounter that we've had with an object out of the Torrid meteor stream was on the 30th of June, 1908, during that June passage through the Torrid meteor stream. It was an object between 60 meters and 190 meters in diameter. It did not even hit the Earth. It exploded in the sky. It was an airburst. And mercifully, it exploded over an uninhabited area of Siberia. What it did was it flattened 80 million trees across an area of 2,000 square kilometers. That's an area roughly equivalent to London, the capital of my country. If it had happened over a major city, the devastation and the loss of life would have been immense. And we would all be paying much more attention to the Torrid meteor stream than we presently do. It happened in the middle of Siberia in an uninhabited area, and as a result, less attention is paid to it. So the astronomers have been looking at the sky, and meanwhile, the geophysicists and geologists have been looking at the ground. Alan West, who I was with at Murray Springs, is one of those. He's a geophysicist. Um, James Kennett is the professor, uh, marine geologist, professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He's a world-renowned expert in paleo-oceanography. Richard Firestone is a staff scientist, nuclear science division, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. James Whitker is a geologist. Albert Goodyear, we met, is an archaeologist. Uh, there are more than 60 of them. They are all mainstream scientific figures. There isn't a single pseudo-scientist amongst them. They are all highly qualified, highly respected individuals. And it is their view that what we are dealing with is the consequences of multiple comet impacts. And they were initially drawn to the problem by a mystery. And that mystery is the epoch called the Younger Dryas. Uh, from the peak of the Ice Age 21,300 years ago, the world gradually began to warm up. But then 12,800 years ago, there was a sudden massive plunge in temperatures. The world became icy cold, and uh, as cold as it was at the peak of the Ice Age. And at the same time, counterintuitively, there was a release of an enormous amount of water into the world ocean, and sea levels were raised. Uh, at, at, at that time. Normally, in an epoch of freezing, you don't get more water in the ocean. It ends up as ice on the, on the continental land masses. And then, 11,600 years ago, there's another massive release of meltwater, and global temperatures shoot up 
very rapidly almost to modern levels. So this was the mystery. They wanted to try and explain that weird climatic episode. Uh, and it's the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis that they have put forward to explain it. Uh, it has been entirely published in peer-reviewed journals. I'm going to show you a few of them. I don't expect you to read them. I just want to make the point that we are dealing with absolutely solid science here. We're not dealing with, you know, fringe guys like Graham Hancock. We're dealing with <laughs> mainstream scientists. This is the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's the first paper they published, 9th of October 2007. At that time, they were dating it to 12,900 years ago. They've refined the dating since to 12,800. Evidence for an extraterrestrial impact 12,900 years ago that contributed to the megafaunal extinctions and the Younger Dryas cooling. Uh, another paper from 2009 in PNAS shocked synthesized hexagonal diamonds in Younger Dryas boundary sediments. Here we have very high temperature impact melt products as evidence for cosmic air bursts of impacts 12,900 years ago. Evidence from central Mexico large platinum anomaly in the Greenland ice core points to a cataclysm at the onset of the Younger Dryas. Evidence for deposition of 10 million tons of impact spherules across four continents 12,800 years before the present. Here's the Journal of Geology, 5th of September 2014. Nano diamond rich layer across three continents consistent with major cosmic impact at 12,800 calendar years before the present. By 2015, they were beginning to estimate what's called the Younger Dryas Boundary Field. The focus of it is on North America and Greenland, but there were further impacts in Europe, and the furthest east the impacts had been traced by then, in 2015, was Syria. Since then, more evidence has uh, emerged. That large platinum anomaly that was reported in 2013 in Greenland, Chris Moore of the University of South Carolina decided to look in Younger Dryas Boundary settlements <laughs> in North America to see if a similar anomaly was there. And it was. This is nature, scientific reports. Widespread platinum anomaly documented at the Younger Dryas onset in North American sedimentary sequences. And as Chris says, platinum is very rare in the Earth's crust, but it is common in asteroids and comets. Here's a paper from 2018. When these massive fragments come in, they send up all kinds of ejecta. And that can include superheated ejecta which rises up into the sky and then falls back to Earth, and it can set forests on fire. And there's evidence of enormous biomass burning episode 12,800 years ago, where continent-sized forests were burning and filling the air with, air with smoke and soot. Another 2018 paper documents evidence for the air bursts reaching as far south as Antarctica, specifically the Taylor Glacier. Um, and here's a report from 2019 sedimentary record from Patagonia, southern Chile, supports cosmic impact triggering of biomass burning, climate change, and megafaunal extinctions at 12.8 thousand years ago, 12,800 years ago. Evidence for this cataclysm is all over North America, and uh, I've done work on this in a previous book, Magicians of the Gods. I'll speak briefly about the channeled scablands in the Pacific Northwest. It's obvious, even from looking at a map, that the channeled scablands have been subjected to some kind of disaster. This, is, this tearing up of the land is very bizarre. Uh, and nobody disputes that it was caused by very large floods. But it's the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis that provides the source and the reason for those floods. Those floods were unleashed by comet fragments hitting the North American ice cap with a tremendous speed, with a massive kinetic energy and heat releasing meltwater. So here, for example, we have the Willamette meteorite. It's an iron meteorite. It weighs 15 tons. It was found in Oregon, but it didn't come from Oregon. It came from much further north in Canada. How did it get to Oregon? It got to Oregon inside an iceberg which was carried on floods 12,800 years ago. The dating is firm and ended up in Oregon. It is not the only example. Uh, here is the town of Wenatchee uh, in Washington state. And up here on the valley side, 500 feet above the valley floor where Wenatchee sits, is an enormous boulder. Uh, and if I put myself on top of that boulder, you can get a sense of the scale of it. It's calculated to weigh 
18,000 tons. And like the Willamette meteorite, uh, it didn't come from Washington State. It came from about 100 miles further north. And it also got there in an iceberg. Ice caps in chains snatch up, enclose rocks, and carry rocks. And this one was brought there in an iceberg that would have been about the size of an oil tank. And that iceberg was being carried on a flood that must have been at least 500 feet deep. And it grounded on the valley side, and it stuck there. And then the flood waters began to recede. The massive iceberg was left on the valley side. Gradually, it melted away and revealed this huge glacial erratic uh, within it. And they are all over the Pacific Northwest. Every one of these giant rocks testifies to an iceberg carried on a flood. Anything that got in the way of this stuff would have been pulverized, swept away, utterly destroyed. This area is so, there's so many of them, they actually call it Boulder Park. Um, I'd highly recommend a visit to the Pacific Northwest. The Channel Scablands are an amazing place to travel through. Um, those floods eroded the landscape in very striking ways. This is an aerial view of a phenomenon called dry falls in Washington State. It is a fossilized waterfall. No water flows through it today. These are just rainwater pools at the bottom. No water flows through it today. It was, in fact, created in just two weeks by an absolutely enormous flood. Uh, and I'm standing looking at just one tiny bit of dry falls with my friend and colleague Randall Carlson here. And to give you a sense of the scale, uh, let's put Niagara Falls in the picture. Wow. There's Niagara Falls, still being created today, and there is Dry Falls, and Dry Falls was created in two weeks. One begins to get a sense of the scale of the flooding that must have been involved to achieve this result. Nature is fractal. What nature does on a small scale, it replicates in the same shapes on a large scale. We are all very used to the phenomenon of current ripples. Anybody who's been to a beach where the tide goes out will see these nice little ripples on the beach. And they might be an inch high and a foot or two long, and they're caused by the receding flood uh, tide waters. On the Camas Prairie in the Pacific Northwest, there are current ripples of a totally different order of magnitude. Let's get closer. There's a vehicle for scale. These current ripples on the Camas Prairie, and they are current ripples, are 50 feet high and 300 feet long. Consider the flood that left those behind. Consider what would have been left after that flood had passed through. Virtually nothing. And you could trace this story right across North America, the St. Croix River in Minnesota with its amazing potholes, Finger Lakes of New York State. There's evidence for large impacts in the northeast of North America. There has recently been discovered a crater there, the Corosol Crater, dated to 12,800 years ago. That on its own should be enough to confirm the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. But there is so much opposition to this hypothesis that the opponents refuse to accept it or even consider it because it's another one of those extraordinary ideas that academics, certain types of academics don't want to accept. And most recently, a 19-mile impact crater found in Greenland. That 19-mile impact crater is almost certainly dated to the beginning of the Younger Dryas, 12,800 years ago. I would be wrong to tell you that that is an established fact, because it's newly discovered, and much more work needs to be done on the dating. But here's the thing. Unlike North America, which lost its ice cap at the end of the ice cap, Unlike Northern Europe, which lost its ice cap at the end of the uh, Ice Age, Greenland didn't lose its ice cap. Uh, what happened was that the Pleistocene, the Ice Age ice, was then covered by Holocene ice. Our era, geologically, is called the Holocene. Um, and the, this crater, underneath it, is only massively disturbed Pleistocene Ice Age ice. And above it is completely undisturbed Holocene ice. And the indications are that we're looking at an event that happened at the junction between that right at the end of the last ice age, in other words, around 12,800 years ago. And it's interesting when you look at the map, that it's called the Hiawatha Glacier Crater. There it is in Greenland. And you can see how close Greenland actually is to North America. 
uh, and this was the epicenter uh, of the Younger Dryas cataclysm. Why did the world get so cold 12,800 years ago? Because that meltwater didn't only flow south over North America, it also flowed in enormous quantities into the Atlantic Ocean. And in the Atlantic Ocean, it stopped the Gulf Stream dead in its tracks. And the Gulf Stream is part of the global meridional overturning circulation of our planet, central heating system of our planet. It broke down. And that's why the Earth was plunged into this incredible episode of freezing cold. And then the other mystery, why did the world suddenly get so warm 11,600 years ago? Why did the last ice sheets collapse into the sea very dramatically then? Uh, and an explanation for this was put forward by the a uh, professor of astronomy at Cambridge University, Sir Fred Hoyle, back in the 1980s. He was intrigued by that sudden sea level rise and temperature increase at the end of the Younger Dryas. And he proposed that what could have caused it was, again, a comet impact. But this time, not on an ice cap, this time in an ocean. If you have comet fragments bombarding a major ocean, you're going to have a massive, massive tidal waves moving at huge speed and you're going to have an enormous cloud of water vapor thrown up into the upper atmosphere that will create a greenhouse effect that could account for that radical warming. And this happened uh, 11,600 years ago. Uh, so it's very clear the science at the beginning of the Younger Dryas is better than the science on the end of the Younger Dryas, but one thing is certain. The Younger Dryas did end abruptly 11,600 years ago, Global temperatures soared, and the remaining ice caps very rapidly collapsed into the sea, causing a dramatic pulse of sea level rise, nominated by geologists as Meltwater Pulse 1b. Meltwater Pulse 1b is dated to 11,600 years ago, or in our calendar, to roughly 9,600 BC. This is the moment where I want to ask, could it be that North America, that Turtle Island, could it be that Turtle Island is Atlantis? I'm not the first to suggest that. There have been many um, efforts to connect North America with Atlantis. Uh, but I hope that in this case I have done so based on the latest and most solid uh, scientific information. Um, Atlantis, at the end of Atlantis, was dated by Plato. Plato is our single source for the Atlantis tradition. Every other Atlantis story is derivative of Plato. And Plato said that he got the story of Atlantis through his family line from the Greek lawmaker Solon, who had visited Egypt in 600 BC. And there Solon encountered priests at the Temple of Sais in the Delta, who told him the story of Atlantis, about how there had once been a great civilization on this planet, uh, an advanced, a powerful civilization, but that it had been destroyed in a flood cataclysm. And when Solon asked the priests, when did, when did this happen? When was Atlantis flooded? They replied very matter-of-factly, 9,000 years ago. That was in 600 BC. Therefore, that was 9,600 BC. Therefore, that was 11,600 years ago. It coincides exactly with Meltwater Pulse 1b. Archaeologists say Plato made the whole story of Atlantis up. If he did, he was astonishingly on the money with the latest <laughs> geological information about sea level rise at the end of the last ice age. Plato tells us that Atlantis was an advanced civilization. It had advanced architecture, advanced agriculture, advanced navigational, shipbuilding, and seagoing skills advanced social and political organization. He says that it was formerly a, a beautiful civilization dedicated to the nurture of spirit, but that as time went by, corruption entered in. Uh, and Atlantis became cruel, it became conceited. Um, it began to impose its power on other less powerful peoples around the world. Um, and in a ringing phrase, it, it ceased to carry its prosperity with moderation. In other words, it became conceited, it became big-headed. And this is uh, a condition that the Greeks called hubris. And hubris was always punished by nemesis. And the suggestion was that the universe struck Atlantis down because of its conceit and its pride and its arrogance and its cruelty. 
The relevant Plato texts are the dialogues of Timaeus and Critias, and in those texts, he tells us that it wasn't primarily the citizens of Atlantis who survived the cataclysm. It was the meek of the earth. It was the more simple people. It was the hunter-gatherers, the herdsmen, and the shepherds who dwelled in the mountains. They were the ones who survived. And unfortunately, they were destitute of letters and education. And so you have to begin all over again like children and know nothing of what happened in ancient times. The whole argument around this is set out in detail in the book. I want to, I'm coming very near the end of the talk now, you may be relieved to hear. Uh, and I just want to return to this issue of NASA's complacency uh, and the notion uh, that if there's doubts about the origins of civilization, there are also some doubts about the future of civilization as well. And this claim of 100 million year intervals between extinction level events is, in my view, uh, irresponsible and complacent. For example, NASA tells us reassuringly that out of, was that me? <laughs> that out of, could we turn it off again? That out of uh, all the objects that it's spotted that cross the orbit of the Earth, not a single one is going to hit the Earth in the next hundred years. And that is absolutely <laughs> true. The problem is the objects that NASA hasn't spotted yet, <laughs> which are calculated to number at least 100,000 potentially hazardous Earth-crossing objects. And scientists are becoming more and more aware that we do not live in a safe era. And it's almost as though the universe is sending us in this generation a wake-up because the numbers of encounters of near misses with asteroids is just growing exponentially. These are headlines from newspapers. I'm not going to read them all, but they're all speaking about near misses of asteroids that come in close to the Earth. 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017. A whole bunch of further reports all the way through 2017, 2018, 2019. NASA warns of a near-miss asteroid passing Earth and another which could destroy it. Uh, 2019, this is March 2019, it's actually <coughs> reporting on an airburst that wasn't even noticed. It took place over the Bering Straits in December 2018. It was photographed by NASA satellites. Those photographs were analyzed, and we know that this happened two days later, March 27, 2019, another report of another giant asteroid uh, skimming past the Earth. But the astronomers who are working on this subject, including the mathematician Emilio Spedicato of the University of Bergamo, are most concerned about the Taurian meteor stream. They, they believe that this unique complex of debris is undoubtedly the greatest collision hazard facing the Earth at the present time. In other words, not only was it responsible for a cataclysm 12,800 years ago and a second event 11,600 years ago, but that it may be responsible for future events as well. Their calculations indicate that there are between one and 200 asteroids of more than a kilometer in diameter orbiting within the Taurus meteor stream. I don't want to spread gloom and doom. Mm -hmm. Far from it. I would like to spread <laughs> positivity. Um, and uh, there is a positive side to this story, because on, rarely for Newsweek, this, this headline is actually true. Asteroids can be stopped, but somebody has to pay. We are a civilization that has reached a level of technology where we could, if we chose to do so, it would be a global and international effort, but we could, if we choose to do so, sweep our cosmic environment clean. We could make this Earth safe for our children and our children's children and all future generations if we chose to do so. For example, if we took really a relatively small part of the trillions of dollars that we spend on mobilizing for warfare, of the vast investments in very clever ways to mass murder other human beings, if we took a bit of that intelligence and a bit of that resources and put it into protecting the Earth, we could do it. It's a choice. It doesn't have to happen. It's entirely up to us. Um, and I'm going to close on this note. If you live in one of these big technological cities, as most of us do, you never see the sky. The light pollution is so severe, you can hardly see a star. You might occasionally see one 
but they're, they're, they're not figuring much in your, in, your, in your daily life. We're cut off from the cosmos. We're not, we're not connected to it anymore. Uh, but if you're up in, the, in, in space, if you're in a NASA satellite, and you look down at the Earth, well, you can see the areas that are industrially developed. Because there is Europe, and it is lit up at night like a string of jewels. That's because it's full of electricity. People are burning lights all night long, and the, the continent of Europe glows when viewed from the heavens. But down here, the Sahara Desert is completely dark, and, and the Namibian Desert, inhabited by hunter-gatherers to this day, is also completely dark, because they don't use electricity there, and it doesn't glow at night. Go to the other side of the world. Here's North America. There's Europe. Here's North America, glowing like jewels at night with all its lights on. And down here in the Amazon, inhabited by hunter-gatherers, hardly any lights at all, because there is no electricity uh, in the Amazon. And we often take this as a sign of our technological achievements, that we are lighting up the Earth at night. Um, in the Amazon jungle, in fact, in the very area where the geoglyphs are found, there are still uncontacted tribes, tribes that do not even know that our advanced civilization exists. They may one day see a helicopter flying overhead. It's taking photographs like this. They'll fire their arrows at that helicopter. They say to one another, what the hell is that? You know, what is that thing? <laughs> Here is uh, the point I want to make. If we foolishly were to allow another event, such as the Younger Dryas impacts, to happen in our time, who would survive it? Would it be us? The spoilt children of the Earth? the inhabitants of the industrialized technological civilizations. Very few of us have any survival skills at all. I'm not saying nobody does, but very few do. Most of us rely on the complicated, interrelated network of other people's skills. We take for granted our supermarket shelves groaning with food, the clothes on our backs, the roofs over our heads, our, our vehicles, our, our cell phones. It's all taken for granted. We don't, many of us don't realize that a food supply in any city is on a just-in-time basis. If you stop delivering food into a city within two to three days, there's no food left at all. And if you cannot renew that supply within a week, the population are going to be starving. Imagine the starving populations of the large cities of the Western technological world would quickly fall into chaos. We are not psychologically strong. We are technologically strong, but we are psychologically weak. Post-traumatic stress disorder would be on a scale of multi-millions. And I believe that our civilization would fall apart. It would literally fall apart. We would not make it through. But who would make it through? Triumphant would be the hunter-gatherers, the meek of the earth, those who Plato called the, the shepherds and the herdsmen. The meek of the earth would make it through because people like these are masters of survival. They're in the business of survival every minute of every day. They know how to do it. They would weather that cataclysm with great success, and it would be their descendants who would carry forward the human story thousands of years into the future. So I like to imagine how it might be 12,000 years from now. There might even be archaeologists then. <laughs> and they, they would be aware of certain, you know, really crazy myths that the old people used to tell about how there was once an incredible civilization on this planet. They, they had powers that were almost godlike. They were almost superhuman, you know. They could send people to the moon. They could fly around the planet. They could look at one another in these little devices on opposite sides of the planet. They could, they could speak to one another. They had everything they needed. But they became corrupt. They became cruel. They became conceited and arrogant. They ceased to wear their prosperity with moderation. They imposed their power on others around the world. And the universe struck them down. So let's make sure we're not the next lost civilization. <laughs>
Every day, new discoveries are being made all across the world and beyond. So let's work together to find out what's next. And remember, we won't know if we don't go. I'll see you in the Vortex.